Welcome to the channel, my name is Brandon, this is Born Again XJW. In today's video, we're gonna be taking a part two look at David Splane's anti-apostate talk. If that sounds like something you're interested in, go ahead and uh, click the subscribe button because we're gonna do a lot more of these in the future. But I do just wanna say, if you find yourself a little bit lost in today's video, I would suggest going and checking out my part one, which I'll, uh, I'll put a card up above and I'll put a link in the description below. And I'll also place a link to the jw.org um, website so that you can see this video for yourself if you want to go and investigate it further and see if I was uh, genuine in my depiction of it. Okay, so um, let's go ahead and dive right in, guys. Here we go. Truly, I say to you, unless one is born of water and the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. Just a few drops of poison in a drink are enough to cause serious harm. And apostates often mix a few truths with uh, lies. Uh, do you remember Eliphaz, one of Job's false comforters? Some of what he said was true. Let's turn to Job chapter 5 and verse 13. Okay, before we follow along with David Splain to Job number, or chapter 5, I'm sorry, um, let's go ahead and just point out something very ironic real quick. So he said, apostates often mix in some truths with lies. And to me, that's ironic because that's exactly what the organization does. That's exactly what the governing body does all the time. Every time they make a false prediction, every time they change a doctrine, it is always mixing some truths in with lies in order to push forward their false narrative or their agenda. If you're a Jehovah's Witness watching this, you're probably not agreeing with me, and I understand. Maybe, you know, keep listening, but fast forward further into the video. If you're a former Jehovah's Witness, you know exactly what I'm saying is correct because you've experienced it yourself. So again, a lot of groups can mix in truths with lies, but I just want to point something out real quick. You see, something that a, a narcissist, if let, let's just bring it in small scale, something that a narcissist will do in a relationship is they will use a psychological tactic called projection. Projection is essentially, if you're guilty of something, you take that same thing that you're guilty of and you project it onto your partner or onto another personal relationship that you have. So a hypothetical would be if um, I was having an affair on my wife and I saw her looking at another man. She may not have been looking at him because she found him attractive. She may have just been looking in that general direction. But because I am guilty of the, the sin or the um, false behavior of, I should say bad behavior, of adultery, I'm being um, unloyal to my wife. I see her looking in the direction of another man and then I turn and my wrath comes down upon her and I blame her for being, um, you know, she wants to be with that guy or I'm overly sensitive about her being around other men or having uh, friends in her life who are men. That is projection, okay? I'm taking my guilt and I'm putting it onto an innocent party. The organization of the Jehovah's Witnesses is a high control group. And if you take um, you know, just a, a narcissist and you expand that over the course of hundreds or thousands or even millions of people, what you get is what's called a organization or a high control group. It's essentially narcissism on a hive mind large scale, okay? And they often project what they're doing, what they're guilty of onto innocent parties in order to defend themselves. So I just wanted to put that out there before we continue on with his little Job speech. Here we go. See if what I read sounds familiar. He catches the wise in their own cunning, so that the plans of the shrewd are thwarted. He catches the wise in their own coming, cunning. Does that sound familiar? Why, yes. The Apostle Paul said the very same thing at 1 Corinthians 3.19. In fact, in the marginal reference that we see in the little a in the, in the middle there, 1 Corinthians 3.19, Paul may even have been quoting Eliphaz. So that was the truth. But how did Jehovah feel about Eliphaz's argument overall? Let's turn to Job 42, verse 7, and see how Jehovah felt about it. Job 42, and verse 7. After Jehovah had spoken these words to Job, Jehovah said to Eliphaz the Temanite, My anger burns against you and your two companions, for you have not spoken the truth about me, as my servant Job has. A few grains of truth were mixed in with falsehoods. And at least some of what Eliphaz said was inspired by the demons. How do we know that? He admitted it. Notice Job 4, verses 15 through 17. 
I'll give you a moment. This is interesting. Job 4, 15 to 17. Eliphaz says, A spirit passed over my face. The hair of my flesh bristled. It then stood still. But I did not recognize its appearance. Let's stop there for a second. I did not recognize its appearance. So he didn't know whom he was talking to, just like someone in a discussion forum may not know whom he is talking to. Let's continue. He says, A form was in front of my eyes. There was a calm. And then I heard a voice. Can a mortal man be more righteous than God? Can a man be cleaner than his own maker? Does it surprise you that a demon will get involved in the debate between Job and the false comforters? It shouldn't. This was no small debate. It was a big issue. Satan had challenged Jehovah in the presence of all the angels that no man would keep his integrity under test. That demon was using Eliphaz to demoralize Job and weaken his faith. This was something that Job had to fight for, and Job fought back. Okay, so David Splain's little Job side trail that he brought us on here is he's talking about how Eliphaz is trying to give advice to Job um, and, you know, Jehovah says, my, my anger burns against you because you, what you said about me is false. And listen, Job is one of the um, pieces of wisdom literature inside of the Bible. Um, I, think it's, I think it's a great book. I think it's a very encouraging book. I think um, what you should do, here, I'll give you this advice, instead of digging too deeply into Job, I would go to uh, YouTube, type in the Bible Project Job, and uh, you'll see a thumbnail that looks like this, or you'll see a thumbnail that looks like this. One of these videos is 11 minutes long. One of them I think is nine, seven to nine minutes long. Anyways, it's not too long, but it's talking about the type of literature that Job is, and it gives you sort of an overview of the entire book. And then what I would do after watching that video is go and read the book of Job for yourself. Um, again, I would say that you know David Splain, pretty much everything the governing body does is a poor application of scripture. They don't know how to use scripture, except for when it comes to misquoting it or propping up a, a false proposition. If you remember from my part one video where we reviewed David Splain's speech, he was talking a lot about these uh, forums, these online messaging boards or Reddits or whatever it happens to be. I think he's in particular mainly talking about YouTube, but I could be wrong. Let's just say it's Reddit or something like that. If you find yourself on these JW forums, his main message was you don't know if you don't know this person, you've never seen this person, you don't know if this person is a Jehovah's Witness or a secret apostate, or if they're a Jehovah's Witness who is spiritually weak, you know, you just don't know. They're unseen, therefore they're untrustable. Uh, now when it comes to <laughs> untrustable, untrustworthy. Okay, when it comes to uh, what he's talking about now, he's reading through Job, he's talking about the advice that Eliphaz gets, and he's saying it's, it's inspired by demons. And then he goes to a scripture, and then he reads that to back that point up. Here's what he's really trying to say, though. What he's saying is um, Eliphaz listened to this unrecognized spirit, a.k.a. a demon in this instance, so when you're on these forums or you're in the comment section of an apostate's YouTube channel or a disgruntled member of the Jehovah's Witnesses, do you see what I'm do you see where I'm going with this? Hopefully you're there now. What I mean is David Splain is saying apostates is equal to demons. Okay? Apostates are demons, and demons inspire apostates. This is what David Splain is trying to actually say. All right, and if you go back and listen to it, you can see that that's what he's trying to say. If there's one thing that Jehovah's Witnesses are taught to fear as much, if not a little bit more, than apostates, actually, I think they might be fearing apostates more, but if there's one thing Jehovah's Witnesses are taught to fear, it is demons and the spiritual realm. And a lot of this is just passed on culturally throughout congregations and stories that people have encountered of like hauntings and you know, artifacts in people's homes that have been demon-possessed and all this other mess. I'm not saying that the spiritual realm doesn't exist. I'm not saying that there's not such a thing as spiritual warfare, uh, but it was very superstitious when I was in, um, and a lot of it was just, you know, anecdotal stories. So anyways, I just wanted to draw that distinction real quick before we continue on. David Splain is saying um, demons are equal to apostates. Apostates are getting their inspiration from demons. Therefore, stay away because you're going to be inspired and misled by demons. That's what he's actually saying. Apostates are more active in some places than they are in others. 
So if there's a lot of apostate activity in your area, people in the territory may be listening and they may challenge you when you meet them in the ministry. So how should you handle it? Don't try to argue with the apostates. Don't read their comments. Ask the elders or other experienced publishers for suggestions on how to answer the householders. I'm hoping you're catching what I just caught when watching this video. He said, what happens when you encounter people in the field or you know, the field ministry, the door-to-door -door work? So if you're a witness, you'll know that language. If you're not, they're talking about when they're knocking on people's doors, that's the, the field ministry. What he just said was if you encounter pushback from people in the field ministry, then that person is an apostate. This flies in the face of any dictionary definition of the word apostate. It also flies in the face of their own definition of apostate. David Splain just said, if you go to someone's door, you knock on their door, they open it up and they say something like, I would never want to be a Jehovah's Witness. You guys let your family members die if they need a blood transfusion. Or I've seen you guys in the, in the news so much and there's all this uh, child sex abuse going on inside of the organization. That person has now become an apostate in the mind of David Swain and the governing body. That makes zero sense. Apostasy in its definition, even the Watchtower's definition, is being a Jehovah's Witness and then leaving and talking bad about the governing body or the beliefs of the Jehovah's Witnesses. You can't just say someone of the world who disagrees with you is an apostate. But this is how desperate the Watchtower is becoming. Anyone who speaks poorly about the Watchtower is now an apostate. And People in the territory may be listening and they may challenge you when you meet them in the ministry. So how should you handle it? Don't try to argue with the apostates. Don't read their comments. Ask the elders or other experienced publishers for suggestions on how to answer the householders. Okay, so what is his advice when you run into anyone who's not a Jehovah's Witness, which he's now declared in this talk that anyone who's not a Jehovah's Witness is an apostate, which makes no sense. But anyways, we'll keep going. So what is his advice? Don't engage with the apostates. Don't read their comments. Don't argue with them, okay? And listen, I'm not a fan of arguing. Um, I am a fan of discussion. I am a fan of debate. I don't think it has to become nasty. Um, in fact, most of the time when people lose their cool, I happen to think that their position is really weak. So that's why they have to resort to yelling and getting kind of crazy. Um, but yeah, debate, um, discussion, all of this stuff is biblical, actually. In the book of Acts, you can see Paul going to the synagogue and he's, you know, debating with the religious leaders there about why Jesus is the Messiah. So I'm a fan of debate and discussion. But anyways, David Splain is saying, don't engage, don't argue, right? He's basically saying, um, <laughs> hear no evil, see no evil, speak no evil. So he's like, be like the three wise monkeys. <laughs> And then, he, and then the advice he gives is go to the elders or someone who's stronger in the faith and ask their advice of what you're supposed to do in the field work. Um, allow me to, if you will, real quick, uh, just point you to the, the B and the I in what's called the BITE model. The BITE model was uh, put forward by a guy named Dr. Stephen Hassan, I believe. Um, and I just want to point out that every, uh, everything that David Splain is saying and suggesting here bleeds into all four of the categories of the BITE model. All right, but we're gonna read specifically from the behavior category and from the information category. And I wanna point out why the advice that he just gave fits perfectly into the behavior and information control of this uh, bite model of the high control group. Okay, so first we're gonna go ahead and read from the uh, behavior control. This is again, the B in the bite model. So we're gonna read number two, which is um, the group will dictate where, how, and with whom the member lives and associates or isolates. So you can see this if, if you are in the field ministry and you're getting pushback, um, then we're going to control that and you're going to run away from that person. This is not even the field ministry. We're talking the comment sections of YouTube or Reddit or JW forums. If anyone's talking negatively, you're supposed to cut ties and this is what the high control, high control group is making you do. All right, number nine. Uh, major time spent with the group indoctrination and rituals and or self-indoctrination, including the internet. I'm pretty sure that one is self-explanatory. Number 12, discourage individualism and encourage groupthink. And number 18, which would be instill dependency and obedience. Okay, so all of these would again be um, behavioral things that you're trying to control. So you get pushed back in a comment section or in the field ministry 
And the first response should be to throw a wall up, shut your mind off, okay? Quit hearing words, quit reading words, quit interpreting language, run the other direction. And then what you're supposed to do from a behavioral aspect is not ask or question or critically think yourself. You're supposed to go to an elder or someone higher up in the organization, and you're supposed to ask them questions on how you should handle the situation. Um, so again, that's the B in the, in the bite model. Now let's go to I, and again, this stands for information control. Um, and we're gonna go ahead and read number two, uh, three, four, and five. So number two is minimize or discourage access to non-cult sources of information, including A, the internet, TV, radio, books, articles, newspapers, magazines, and media, B, critical information, C, former members, that's a big one, D, keep members busy so they don't have time to think and investigate. Before we continue on with uh, going to three, four, and five, I just wanna to touch on a few of these real quick. Again, we have a uh, minimize or discourage access to non-cult sources of information. The governing body in this talk, David Splain, is trying to do that right now. He, they know instinctively, um, I mean, they wish. They wish that the internet didn't exist. They wish that people didn't have the free will to go on the internet or even the access to it. So what they're trying to do is they're trying to clamp down on their behavior and the information they're consuming by saying it is poison, that apostates are poisonous, and they're inspired by demons, and this is why you should stay away. So they're trying to use scare and fear tactics. Um, they try and use Armageddon a lot to get people scared of, you know, eternal destruction. Um, but they're really trying to clamp down on the information that the people have access to. And I like that they put in uh, critical information. So critical information would, again, be like the scandals that you discover in the Watchtower, that they're paying millions of dollars in fees, um, you know, settling outside of court, uh, to protect, um, again, child predators within their organization. So when you hear all of that stuff, uh, it might get you thinking that there's something wrong with the information, so they try and shield them from that critical information. Former members especially, that's going to be a big thing that they have to keep you away from because they're going to tell it like it is most of the time. I'm not saying that there are no liars in the XJW community. Um, and then I really like point D, keep members busy so they don't have time to think and investigate. Isn't that the truth? <laughs> that is the truth. If you are not getting ready for a meeting, we're talking like personal Bible study. I think they call it home worship now, um, family worship time, which is just studying the Bible. I thought it was like, you know, praise and worship, like with music and stuff like the Mormons. Um, but anyways, yeah, they have family worship. Then you have your Bible study to get ready for the theocratic ministry school. And then you have another Bible study to get ready for the Sunday meeting. And then you have the letter writing work that they're doing now because they're not really going door to door. So it's just constant. You're constantly being told, do this, do this, do this, do this. So by the end of the night, you're so exhausted. You don't want to research anything. You don't want to think critically about anything. You just want to hop on Netflix and watch something. And that's what a high control group likes to do. Okay, let's continue on with point number three. Point number three would be compartmentalize information into outsider versus insider doctrines. Uh, a, ensure that information is not freely accessible. B, control information at different levels and missions within the group. And C, allow only leadership to decide who needs to know what and when. Okay, and last two points, point number four and five. So we have encourage spying on other members, impose a buddy system to monitor and control member, report deviant thoughts, feelings, and actions to leadership, and C, ensure that individual behavior is monitored by group. Now, real quick on point five, this is talking about, again, uh, policing within the community, and that certainly does happen. But look at what uh, David Splain just encouraged people to do, and I call it self-policing. Um, I've even seen examples of my family self-policing by reporting their own crimes to the elders, okay? Um, but you encounter apostates in the, in the field or on Reddit or on YouTube, and then you go to that elder and you tell them, I've encountered this thing, I may have spoken to them, but I, I quickly got away. Okay, well, well, without you knowing it, you've already put a stain on your record. Because um, uh, they keep records of very strange things when you're a Jehovah's Witness. So anyways, um, that elder might tell it to another elder. They might put it in the notes in your file. Yes, you do have a file on you when you're a Jehovah's Witness. Um, that you've actually encountered apostates and that you had to remove yourself from the situation or you engaged with them or whatever the particulars of your situation happen to be. But you just self-policed yourself. 
And if you didn't police yourself, then possibly the person that you were in service with went to the elders and did it to you, okay? So this policing is definitely happening and it's a way that information is controlled inside of the organization. Now we're gonna to go to point number five, okay? And point number five is extensive use of cult-generated information and propaganda, including newsletters, magazines, journals, audio tapes, videotapes, YouTube, movies, and other media. B, misquoting statements or using them out of context from non-cult sources. I have so much to say on this, but if you follow what we're doing right now, we are reviewing propaganda material from the Watchtower in order to tell Jehovah's Witnesses how to behave when encountering anyone who is not a Jehovah's Witness. Again, they're now determining that everyone who's a non-JW is an apostate, even though it does not fit any definition on the planet. So we're trying to control their behavior, we're trying to con control their information through the propaganda video that we're watching right now uh, produced by the Watchtower. And obviously we know that they produce magazines and journals that say the same exact thing. And then the last one that I found really interesting in the information control is quoting statements or using them out of context from non-cult sources. I recently did a video where the Watchtower went to the Encyclopedia Britannica to uh, pull like two or three sentences from this uh, encyclopedia to try and prove their point. And then I went to that article and read it in full, showing how it's actually saying the opposite of what Watchtower is quoting them for. So they managed to go and quote mine and cherry pick from this article to make it seem like the Encyclopedia Britannica was agreeing with them. This is something they do constantly. It's obnoxious. So you can't really trust a group that falls so perfectly within the bite model. It's, I, I mean, lots of groups could fall into the bite model. Not all of them are nefarious, I don't think, but if anything becomes overreaching into your personal life or um, abusive in the sense that your community is being used as a threat against you, that's something that you wanna run away from. That's something that, and not running away like you're a coward, it's something that you need to remove yourself from because it actually is toxic in your life. Well, how poisonous our apostate teachings. Let's find out as we watch the following video. When I was in my 40s, I was divorced. I had three younger kids at home. I was working three jobs and I had drifted away from the congregation. I had an acquaintance who was telling me that I was in a cult and that I needed to look at some information that he had. Okay, I'm gonna try and um, interrupt as little as possible, I promise, but I just wanna point out, you know, uh, and it, this story is very sad, I'm not poking fun, I promise. But this woman is in her 40s, she somehow has three small children, she's somehow working three jobs. She's very stripped down to her, you know, bare essentials of what she's able to hold on to to hold her life together as far as energy is concerned. I can imagine if I had three young children, if I was a single parent and I was working three jobs, there would be no mental capacity for any sort of critical thinking skills whatsoever. The reason I point this out is because this woman is being trotted forward as an example of someone who's about to receive, you know, encouragement from becoming Jehovah's Witness and rejoining the congregation. I just wanna say that this is exactly the type of person that this group will look for. And I'm not saying that individual rank and file Jehovah's Witnesses are not merciful and that they don't try and help their other congregation members. That's not what I'm saying. I'm saying that the organization, the ideal candidate for someone to join would be someone like this woman who is so beaten down, downtrodden, that she has no ability for critical thinking skills. When I was about 30 years old, a fellow employee saw that I was one of Jehovah's Witnesses and was trying to access JW.org. He told me about someone he knew in another country who could prove to me that Jehovah's Witnesses didn't have the truth. That made me curious, and little by little, I was persuaded to look at apostate material. So I was born and raised in the truth, chose to dedicate myself to Jehovah at the age of, of 16. But I began to associate with people who had either formerly been associated with the truth or were very loosely associated with Jehovah and his his organization, and that's really where the apostasy began to take root. 
As I was reading this literature, I saw through it to an extent. But when you're drifting away, you're looking for a reason not to believe. Again, the, the propaganda video isn't telling us what information she was reviewing, um, and they're not telling us how she knew that she could see through it to an extent, okay? So, for instance, let's say that you're reading, I'm, I keep bringing it up, but it is a horrible problem that is inside of the Watchtower, and it's something that needs to be talked about until it is dealt with and taken care of. But the actual child sex abuse that is occurring within the Jehovah's Witnesses and is being guarded by the Watchtower Bible and Tract Society, if she's reading information about that and she says, I saw through it to an extent, that means that her personal experience does not allow her to feel like this could ever be something that happens. Maybe this woman happens to be so fortunate and lucky that her particular congregation, this has never been an issue. Or if it has, it was hidden um, it was hidden from her by the elders and from everyone else in the congregation. So they might not know that this is actually a problem inside of the congregation and that someone is either a victim or a perpetrator inside of her congregation. So when she says, I saw through it to an extent, they're not telling us what information she was presented with and how she knew that it was false information. They're not honoring us with any of that so we can draw our own conclusions because that doesn't matter. What they want you to focus on is the fact that she said, I was already drifting away, so I was looking for reasons to not believe. And there are cases when that happens, for sure. We want to do our own thing, so we try and find things that will allow us to not believe. I'm on board with that. But I will say this too. If you find evidence, and that evidence happens to be true, that's not an excuse that you're looking... That's not a reason that you're looking for to leave. You just happen to find something that is true, and it disturbed you to the core. I began to feed my mind with different philosophies, different ideas, uh, even studied uh, different religions. And, and you know, I told myself that I was doing that academically, but it started to influence the way that I thought and felt about things. Eventually the elders reached out to me. I, I was very combative with those brothers. I even made the accusation that Noah's Ark was a fairy tale, that that was part of mythology. Um, okay, real quick, let's just take a look at this. This What this gentleman said, um, he said he started searching for truth in different philosophies, different religions. Then you see him looking at, uh, at a depiction of, you know, a monkey becoming a man, so evolution. Um, listen, as a Christian, you can have certain precepts, old earth, young earth, um, you know, evolution, special creation, all of these other things. Let me just say the one statement that I think we should all agree on, and that is, if something is true, we should believe it. One more time. If something is true, we should believe it. Now, I don't think the jury's out on whether or not um, we are the, the process of, of random evolution. You know, of course, there are some people who believe in theistic evolution. I personally am not one of those people. Now, I personally also am not someone who has done a ton of research into it. I don't think it lends any weight to the moral argument. The only thing I will say is if you're an accident, uh, one thing uh, another person does to you has no moral repercussions, or you shouldn't even have opinions on it because it's just something that happened. But if you happen to be made in the um, Imago Dei, or the image of God, and you bear his image, then you are worthy of honor and respect and uh, protection. So I can say because we're made in the image of God, that that demands that you not do wrong to me and I not do wrong to you. That's all I'm saying. So uh, one other thing he pointed out is I, I even thought that Noah's Ark was a myth at one point, and here's where I'm going to agree with the Jehovah's Witnesses, and here's why. Because I'm going to believe the guy who was crucified, who was buried, who rose again and defeated death on the third day. That guy named Jesus Christ, God in the flesh, the fact that he came and did that, and there's history and uh, there's evidence in history that he did do that. When he talks about in the days of Noah, when he talks about Noah in his ministry, I'm going to believe him. I'm not going to believe anyone else. I'm going to believe the man that defeated death, the God that came into creation and took on the, the punishment for our sins. I'm going to believe him, okay? So, uh, yeah, I agree with the Watchtower when they uh, talk about Noah's Ark being a historical event. Now, do I think it was the whole planet? I'm not sure. There's a lot of stuff in the in the Old Testament that I think 
is lost on us because we're we're English speaking twenty first century people uh, when this book was written to ancient Israelites. So, with that being said, let's go ahead and continue on with the video. Those apostate doubts that I was reading kept going deeper and deeper into my heart. I stopped reading the publications. I stopped going to the meetings, and as a result, my spiritual routine was dead. So I thought I'd try to find truth elsewhere, and I looked for something out there that was in accord with what I knew the Bible taught. But I couldn't find anything. Okay, here's an interesting point. He's saying he's trying to find truth. So he was looking for anything else out there that matched what he knew. So he's saying he has an absolute full knowledge of what is true from the Bible, that he knew what the Bible taught and he couldn't find it. Here's why. Because your foundation is the Jehovah's Witness teaching. If you're going out there looking for what Jehovah's Witnesses believe outside of the organization, you won't find it. Why? Because they're a splinter group that came up in the late 1800s and their doctrines have been changing over time. So no, you're not going to find what the Jehovah's Witnesses teach outside of the Jehovah's Witness organization. That's exactly the point. Well, one Sunday morning, I rode by the Kingdom Hall and I said to myself, oh, they're all in there waiting for Armageddon. Immediately, when I thought that thought, I said to myself, well, at least they feel good about themselves. How do you feel? And the answer was, I felt terrible. I hate this part of the video. This is the worst. You know how when you're, you're listening to someone and you can tell they're barely holding it together. And again, this is not to poke fun, but this woman is like on the edge of becoming unhinged, even though she's in the congregation now and, and she's saying that she's happy. You can hear that quiver in her voice that she is this close. And yes, my fingers are touching to losing it. So this woman doesn't need to just join a religion. This woman needs actual help. Like you can hear it in her voice. She needs a psychiatrist. And that is not a shameful thing at all. That's something that this woman requires. And the fact that she is being trotted out in front of millions of Jehovah's Witness via this uh, presentation during the convention is horrible and despicable. But notice what she said. She said, I passed by a kingdom hall. I thought they're all in there just waiting for Armageddon. And then I thought to myself, at least they feel good about themselves. If I was to sit you down and say, hey, you know what? You shouldn't work. Tomorrow, a million dollars is going to come your way. And you just sat there and you felt good because I told you that a million dollars is going to come your way tomorrow. But that wasn't the truth. Tomorrow came, tomorrow went, and you were still short that million dollars I promised you. You may have felt good when I told you the lie, but you didn't feel good when you discovered that it was a lie. So what this woman is saying is, I don't really care if it's true. I don't care if Armageddon is on the horizon or it's not. When I look at the people in that kingdom hall, I think to myself, at least they feel good and I feel miserable. She feels miserable because she needs help, not because she needs a lie in her life. Eventually, skillful use of the scriptures and just reasoning with me, the elders it got me to realize that I had been carried off or that I had been taken captive by human philosophy, by the, the deceptions and this empty reasoning of men. I love how they have, you know, they have him with, with no jacket on. This is to show he's a lower rank. So he has no jacket. He just has a tie on. And then the three elders who are helping him, they all have jackets on because they're, they're more holy than thou art. Um, and they all have their Bibles up and open. Like that's actually how a Bible study goes when you're a Jehovah's Witness. That's not true. They're talking about how he was taken away by the, the false philosophies of men and all this other stuff, another scripture that they like to quote out of context. Listen, here's the thing. They probably read him one, one Bible verse, and then proceeded to read three Watchtower magazines or three different publications about that one verse that they read him. They do not study the Bible, they cite the Bible. And then with the <laughs> doctrines of men, they continue to beat you over the head with their understanding and their teaching. There's a saying that if you pour enough water over a rock, you'll smooth, you'll smooth its edges over time. And that's essentially what happened to this guy. They talked to him and they talked to him and they talked to him and they talked at him and at him and at him until finally he broke under their pressure and he decided to say, you know what? Everything that Watchtower is teaching is completely true. I know because you read me three magazines and then you quoted a Bible verse, so it must be from the Bible. I actually said a prayer. 
I supplicated Jehovah that he would really show me the way to the truth. And he took away this feeling of emptiness, spiritually speaking. I realized that relationship with Jehovah, that's our most precious possession. I had to get back. I started to study the Bible with sincerity. I wanted it to affect my mind and my heart, and I wanted it to affect change in my behavior. Now, as I did that, I felt Jehovah blessing those efforts. He began to help me to, to rebuild that relationship with Him. So I began to use Jehovah's name. Speaking about Jehovah became a wonderful joy and a great pleasure to me. And the result was that my ministry was very productive. And it's an amazing joy to be able to help someone come to love Jehovah. I was just so happy to be back under Jehovah's wings and have that peace of mind. How loving Jehovah is. He wants to help us. And what better helper could we have? He's the best in the universe. So in summary, if you change your behavior, you start to believe exactly what the brothers are telling you, that the um, Bible says, even though you've, you know, you've done research on your own, but what the, what the elders are telling you is right and what you're thinking is wrong and you should only trust them as the source of truth. And if you pray to Jehovah and ask him to reveal himself to you, and if you go back to the kingdom hall, because uh, you need to be in, a, in some sort of physical space where you can feel his presence, and if you, you know, do all of these works, you will get back under the wings of Jehovah, and he will love you and not curse you. Again, it's always a works-based salvation. There really is only two religions on the planet. Um, there's do and there's done, Okay. If you are a Muslim, a Mormon, a New Ager, a New Apostolic Reformationist, if you're a name it and claim it, if you're someone who believes in the secret, you have to do something. You have to speak it into existence. You have to clear out your chakras. You have to practice good karma. What you do good, good comes back to you. You have to do, do, do all of this stuff. Whereas Christianity, Jesus Christ says, it is finished. There's the do religions and there's the done religion and Jesus Christ is the done religion. It is finished, is what he said on the cross. The debt's been paid. So I wanna encourage you with that, is it's not about, again, earning your salvation. It's not about working your way into grace, which makes zero sense. It's all about turning and placing your faith in Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. You are not trying to go based off of your own righteousness, of which, none of us really has any righteousness. Uh, we all have a lot of laws that we have broken. We all have a lot of evil deeds that we have not only done physically, but also in our hearts. So this is something that we can't get out from under, but we can have a judge who is rich in mercy and he extends that mercy to us and says, I've already paid the debt for you. All you have to do is accept the gift and then you are saved. So I would if I was a Jehovah's Witness right now, I would give you the advice to go into the Bible, read John all the way through. I encourage all of the Gospels, all of Matthew, Mark, Luke, but I will say John is my favorite. Read it and see who is Jesus Christ. Figure that out. Who is this Jesus you say you're following? You need to follow the right one because he even warned about there being false messiahs and false Christs. So you need to get that right. Place your faith in the right Savior, and he will save you, not yourself. This isn't of any works, lest any man should boast. So I encourage you guys, if you have any comments on what I said today in the video, you happen to disagree with me in any, any way, shape, or form, I am open to disagreement. Um, if you want to, we can sort of vet that out in the comment section. So again, as long as you're respectful to me, and as long as you're respectful to other people in my comment section, your comment will remain there. Anyways, I want to thank you guys so much for watching this video. I hope you found it helpful and uplifting. And uh, no matter what, I hope you guys have a wonderful day and God bless. Truly, I say to you, unless one is born of water and the spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God.